Uh, my name is Jay McCarthy. I'm happy to be here with you at Strange Loop. It's very odd for me to not be presenting a research talk just about something that, you know, just kind of old that I know a lot about. Um, it's also weird to be teaching you something old and not preparing to give you a grade on it. Um, but I hope that you'll enjoy and you'll learn something as well. My talk is called Continuations on the Web and in Your Operating System. I've got three major things that we'll be talking about. First, what are continuations? I assume that most of you maybe have heard continuations, but you know, like monads, you know, just being an endofunctor in the category of monoids, you know what I mean? Like just knowing what the definition of a continuation is uh, is not really useful for knowing why they're useful. So I'll really dig deep into what a continuation is, and in particular, what delimited continuations are. I'll talk about their classic uses on the web, and then I'll talk about more exotic uses of continuations. So to start off with, what is a continuation? The continuation, the classical definition, is the rest of the computation, meaning that at any given point in a program, the continuation is all the things that will happen in the program after this piece of the program is done. For instance, <clears throat> If we look at this computation here, uh, this beautiful program with four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, my favorite numbers, and addition, multiplication, and subtraction, my favorite operators. So this program right here results in a negative 27. Uh, not my favorite number, but it'll do. If we zero in on that subtraction right there, uh, we can ask, what is, the, what is the continuation of this piece of the program? And every piece of the program has a continuation, no matter what programming language you're using. The continuation of this piece of the program is everything outside of that little box. This uh, new box represents the continuation, and that dark box is where the answer from the sort of current program, the subtraction, will go after it's done. Uh, if you're uncomfortable with bananas, we can convert to a more buttery C-like syntax and look at this program, which is really the same program uh, and I've highlighted the same expression, the subtraction. And here, the continuation is also the rest of the computation. What will happen when this piece of the program is done? So it's this little thing right here. Typically in you know, these old-fashioned languages with this kind of syntax, it's a little bit more obvious what the continuation is. So going back to banana world, though, this continuation right here is just a mental concept that we can have as programmers of what's happening in our program. We could represent this inside of the language as a function. So for instance, uh, in Racket, I can write it like this. So first of all, I find the Lambda button on my keyboard, and I hit that. And now I've got a function which encapsulates or represents the behavior of the continuation of that subtraction. So we have the lambda that takes in a z and uses that z in the same context that the black box used to be in. So this right here uh, is a continuation that uh, we're not running, so that's why the result is just the procedure. So uh, in a language, so you can always, every programming language, every piece of the program has a continuation. In some languages, you can represent that as a function, particularly when there are first class functions available. And in a language like Racket, that representation can be done automatically for you through a function called, in Racket it's called letcc. So what letcc does right here, uh, notice that it's, uh, it takes the place of that box that I had before. So letcc k says name the continuation, that function which I showed you before, name it k. Now, as you all know, the word continuation starts with the letter K. <laughs> of course it doesn't. Uh, but we name it K because of tradition. There's this famous thing called the CESK machine, which is a formalism. And K stands for continuation, and C stands for code. And since C was already taken, we had to find another letter. And so we use K now. Anyways, so what this program does right here is it simply names the continuation. And the beautiful thing about names is that once you have them, you can start using them all over the place. So we can ask the question, what happens when we actually use this name? So for instance, here I've changed the program to name the continuation k, subtract 7 from 6, getting negative 1, and then call k with it. And notice that the result is a question mark, because this is a test. So do you think that the answer to this is uh, negative 27? Or do you think the answer to this is something else? Remember, negative 27 is what it was before, um, where you know, when we send uh, negative 1 here, we multiply it by 5 and 8, and then we add in the 13. 
Or does that negative 27, which the whole program used to return, go back in to the multiply and then go in through the plus again? So it's either a really big negative number or a really small negative number. The really big negative number would be 1,067, and the small negative number would be negative 27. Well, to find the answer to this, we have to go back to what I told you was the representation of the continuation. I told you it was this, but actually I lied to you. Because the program, the future of the computation, is not just the multiply and the addition. It's actually your program ending and then printing out the result. So in reality, the future of the computation contains this call to exit right here. Because if you look at the whole future of your program, they all eventually end. At least we hope that they do, because we don't normally want infinite loops. So what that means is that when we call the continuation like this, it's not like dropping in the whole program again right there so that it will go out again. It's more like dropping in the program, including that little exit. And since that exit is there, the program does not run twice. It just runs once. So this is, of course, what the actual result of that let cc is. So it's important to be able to recognize that, in this sense, continuations are undelimited, which means that they, they typically take, um, represent the entire future of the program, including the exit. Um, in a language like Racket, we have the ability to uh, name a place at which the continuation will stop, um, stop being named. So that's called a with prompt. So with prompt is a way to say, the continuation shall go this far and no further. Uh, and so here, I've put the with prompt around the exit, or right before the exit. Then when I use let cp, which is a version of let cc that is the delimited version, this continuation k here only captures the multiply and the plus. It does not capture the exit. Therefore, the answer is the negative 67. So these are just the basics of using continuations. Now, continuations are one of those uh, fairly complicated things where there are really strange consequences to uh, this semantics for them. So for instance, after we call k and observe our own future, we can then behave differently and multiply it by 2. So this program, inside of the right before the subtract, it looks at what its future is sends a negative 1 there, gets the answer back, and then multiplies it by 2 before going to the future again. It gets to sort of relive history, uh, which is really the future from its perspective, which is very odd. We can, in fact, do even more weird things, like going to the future multiple times. Of course, we were already going to the future multiple times, but now we're going to the future a third time. Uh, where we go to the future with negative 1, come back with that negative 27, multiply by 2, and then go out again. And now we get a giant uh, negative number, you know, 85,867. Uh, that's actually my favorite number, which is why I chose negative 27 in the first place. So anyways, we can do even more bizarre things like saying, well, what if I send a negative 1 to the future? Is that going to be positive? If it is going to be positive, then I really do want to send that negative 1. Otherwise, I'll send a 0. And since the answer ends up being negative 27, it's not positive, so we send the 0. Thus, the, the full answer is you know, 5 times 0 times 8, which is 0. And then we add 4 and 9 and get the 13. So we're observing our own future and then doing something different based on that behavior. But of course, this is all delimited by that with prompt. So our actual future might end up returning a positive number. For instance, if we were to multiply by negative 1 outside of the with prompt. So here, with prompt is sort of like a veil over the future that we can't see beyond. Uh, and so continuations, and particularly delimited continuations in this way, uh, have uh, surprising answers sometimes. Now, this all probably just seems really bizarre, um, which is why we're going to stop uh, twiddling with continuations, and we're going to look at some of their uses, particularly on the web. But to summarize, continuations represent the future of a computation. They themselves can be represented as functions. And they come in different varieties, undelimited, undelimited ones, which are the entire future, and delimited ones, which are the future up to a point. Finally, languages like Racket give you all these uh, wide varieties. Um, and, many, and very few languages give you all these options. So let's go on to how they're used on the web. If we look at a really simple uh, command line program like this, 
This is the add two numbers.exe. So first it's going to prompt for the first number, then it's going to prompt for the second number. Then after that it will add the two numbers and print out the answer. So we start running this, it says enter first number. I type in two, then zero, then it tells me enter the second number, then I type in two and two, and it gives me the sum is 42, which is all our favorite number, right? Now if we were to try to convert this program into a web application, it's not as simple as just saying, well, web printf that you know, uses angular brackets, and web prompt, which you know, puts in a form or something like that. We all know that it's not as simple to do this, and the main reason is that because HTTP is stateless, Whenever you send a response to a request, you're not allowed to wait for another response that is semantically connected to the first request. Which means that every time you send a question out on the web, you have to, in addition to sending the question, tell the user where they should send the answer to. This is why web pages contain you know, the URL that the form will go to or the URL uh, that links will go to as well. That's a way of telling the client where they should send their answer. So when you were, if you were to write this in a normal um, uh, web environment, you would do something like build a dispatching table that says if you go to the URL slash, then we're going to prompt enter the first number and we're going to tell the user that they should send the answer to slash sum and then put their answer afterwards in the URL. Then if you were to come to slash sum and it would be 20, then you say, okay, that, you know, that matches this, the way that this URL looks, so I'm going to parse out that first and say, well, give me the second number and go on back to us with you know, slash sum, slash 22, slash 20. Then at that point, the third case in the dispatcher would take over and then we'd be able to actually add them up and print them out. So most web applications um, that focus on server interaction like this look like this, where the programmer has to manually split up all the control flow of their application into discrete steps, which correspond to URLs. And uh, useful web frameworks uh, like Ruby on Rails and that sort of thing make it really easy to bind functions to URLs, but they don't do anything to help us take the control flow structure and map that onto a set of URLs. That's something that we need to do as programmers typically. But what we're doing here is we're actually manually turning our program into have explicit continuations. For instance, if we were to say, well, continuation one receives the first answer, and um, in when we first start the program, we web prompt and we go to enter first number and we say, well, the answer should go to continuation one. And then inside of continuation one, we prompt for the second number and say, go to continuation two. Uh, and then in continuation two, we actually have both numbers now and we add them. So this process of manually transforming programs into their, their explicit continuation version is something that web programmers have done for a very long time. But of course, if we were in a language that gave us the ability to automatically know what the continuation were, then we could build a new kind of web server that could implement web prompt directly. So here is more or less the actual implementation of web prompt from the Racket web server which does this. The first thing that we do is we capture the continuation on the server, which is the future of the server's computation. Then we store that continuation in a dispatching table, just like uh, normal dispatching tables uh, map URLs to functions. This storing gives us back a new URL, and then we send that URL out uh, to on the web page, so it would say like the form should go here. Uh, and now when the, web when the web client comes back, it executes that continuation as opposed to one of the top level functions that we wrote to begin with. So this is more or less exactly how the Racket web server works, at least on the servlet side. If we were to look at how the server works, um, oh, there's a lot more details, uh, and I would suggest that you look at some of my research papers in Oops Law, ICFP, or the Higher Order Symbolic Computation paper if you are interested in more of those details, particularly on how to make it uh, really efficient to do this. So if we were to look at how the web server itself works, though, the web server is really a function that takes in some servlet, which is seen as something that transforms HTTP requests into HTTP responses. And how it works is it sort of runs in an infinite loop. This is one of the infinite loops we like, by the way, a network server. Uh, and then it will wait for a connection. Once the connection is available, it'll wait for a request. And once the request is around, it gives the request to the servlet, which is supposed to return an answer. Then once it has the answer, it displays that out to the connection. 
Now, of course, because of HTTP 1.1, you know, there could be multiple connections, but stuff like that is not really that interesting. The more interesting thing comes from how this works um, with the continuations. So, for instance, if we go back and we look at the implementation of WebPrompt, we capture this continuation here. And notice that it's an undelimited continuation, which means that it goes all the way to the exit. Which means that the continuation of the servlet includes the behavior of the server, including the behavior of sending the answer back. And since continuations know what their lexical context is, it would actually, if uh, you made a request on one channel and then the new request came on the second one, the second handler would try to send the answer back to the first request. It would be as if the web server were written like this, where we wait for a connection, connection one, and then we have request one and response one, but by the time we get connection two and request two, request two refers to the URL that is the continuation generated by request one. So that when you display the answer for response two, you're actually in request one's future, not request two's future. Because you've gone back in time by calling the continuation. Thus, tr you, you end up trying to send the response down a network channel that doesn't exist anymore. So it's essential when you're using continuations that you know um, where the continuation goes. And this is why delimited continuations are so important um, rather than just undelimited continuations. So this means that the actual implementation of the web server puts a prompt around the call to the servlet to make sure that any continuations it captures only go back to the servlet. And um, there's one more thing, which is that uh, this send to client idea uh, is actually uh, something that continuation prompts allow as well. Continuation prompts specify the area, allow you to um, represent the continuation back to that, that point. But in addition, they allow you to sort of be like an exception handler and throw a value back there. And that's called aborting the current continuation, where you send a value back to that point. You can think of it like an exception handler. Uh, but actually, it's technically more accurate to think of exception handlers as being continuation aborts, where you can represent an exception handler as whenever you say what the handler is, that's really a prompt, and then exceptions are aborting back to that prompt. So that's enough about uh, obvious. Oh, yeah, and there's just a few little details that actually it's really important that prompts are first class citizens. There's not just one prompt. It's important for there to be many, many prompts that can be dynamically generated so that different uses of continuations for different purposes don't interact poorly with one another. So um, now we'll get to the sort of more complicated stuff. Okay, so the first thing is more complicated ways uh, of using. Uh, continuations on the web. So the first idea is that is called web components. So right here, this is a little bit of a dense uh, piece of code uh, that's using the actual functions available on the Racket web server. So what this does is it calls send suspend dispatch, which gives you a function called embed URL. What embed URL does is it transforms functions into URLs that call those functions. When the function returns, it returns to the same place send suspend dispatch would have returned to. So what this program does right here is it has two links. The first link says first, and the second link says second. And when you click on them, it changes what the header is. So the header starts off as something. When you click on first, it becomes first. Then when you click on second, it becomes second. The more interesting thing, though, is where it says right here, include counter. So include counter is this other function that's going to drop in um, two more links, one to a subtraction button and one to an addition button. And what these buttons do is they control the value of a counter that's being stored in this web component. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that the first thing that include counter does is it captures the continuation of its caller. That means that include counter captures a continuation which represents a future in which a web page is being generated and being sent back to the user. And this web page that's being generated is one that includes a header. And every time you interact with the addition or the subtraction link, it loops back around to the beginning of include counter, where it returns a different value, a different HTML page to its um, parent, to its caller. So this is almost like a server-sided iframe, where you have a totally sealed off piece of interaction inside of a much larger piece of action, 
piece of interaction through the use of continuations to capture that context. So this is a really simple uh, example, but there are more complicated ones that would actually be valuable that are not just inserting counters into programs. But none of those fit on the slide. So let's look at that one more thing. So another more advanced use of uh, continuations is in event-based network servers. So for instance, if we look at a typical uh, network server, it would look a lot like that web server that I showed before where you know, you have some file descriptor where you read a request, then you read another one, you'll compute some answer involving those, generate a response, send the answer back, and then free some resources. So if you uh, know anything about network servers, you will look at this and you'll say, this must be terrible. And the reason it must be terrible is that this uh, read request right here, uh, it's likely to block, meaning that as it's waiting for more network packets to arrive, the whole program is frozen waiting for this to return. So it's far more advantageous to use non-blocking interactions like ePoll or KQ or something like that. But when you use those things, you have to um, transform your program into one where you have made explicit what the events, uh, what the events are and what should happen afterwards. So if you know uh, Node.js, Node.js is programmed this way, and it exposes that programming model to you. So here's a little simple example of an event loop where we have a list of events, and we're going to synchronize on them, and we'll return one of the events that succeeds, um, that's available. That means like the network packet is, has arrived. Uh, and then each event in our formalism will receive a function that it can call uh, with whatever new events it generates when it succeeds. And what it's going to do is it's going to return, uh, it's going to call itself again with whatever the new events are. So we can represent that old network server by calling event loop by starting it off with a list that will handle the read request event and generate a request to, request one, I'm sorry. And then these four dot dot dots, if we zoom in there, what we do after we've successfully um, read the first request is we generate a new request, uh, sorry, a new event that will read the second request. If we zoom in on these dot dot dots again, uh, we can now finally compute the response and we can generate an event that is waiting to send the answer back. And when that event succeeds and the answer has been fully sent, we can then finally free the resources and notice that next empty, we're now done with this sequence of events, so we can throw this away. So this style of network, uh, of event-based network servers is widely used in C programs uh, that are based on ePoll. When you use ePoll, you have to explicitly break up your code into each step of the continuation. When you're programming in JavaScript, because uh, you can't make uh, long-running actions, you have to break up your code and put it in between timeouts, basically. So you say you sort of have a zero timeout that does some work and then sets a new zero timeout. So all these ways of breaking your code up with asynchronous interactions are all indications that you're manually producing continuations. Now, if our language supports continuations, then we could write a version of read request that captured our context realized what its continuation was, and then generated an event and sort of sent it off to the event loop and said, you know, go wait until this is done, and when it's ready, call this continuation. And so this uh, style of uh, masking blocking calls uh, over non-blocking interfaces is really what a threading system does. When I say threading system, I mean a cooperative threading system. A threading system that's provided by the operating system truly has blocking in it, but one that's provided on top, so-called green threads or user-level threads, will hide these blocking operations uh, as non-blocking ones. And essentially what, what the threading piece does is it will capture the context of that thread, which is its continuation. So if we zero in on this idea a little bit more, we can talk about how delimited continuations are really used inside of operating systems. Because operating systems are little more than threading systems, um, where the threads, of course, are the procedures. However, uh, there's one more thing that operating systems do, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So here is a complete implementation of a threading system using continuations uh, in about you know, 12 lines. So we have a list of threads, which is initially empty. When you spawn a thread, you just add it uh, to the end of the list of threads. Um, when you want to switch threads, if there are any available, meaning that the thread list is not empty, then you'll grab that first one and you'll you know, replace the list of threads with the rest. And then you'll call that next function, which performs the computation that is the next step of some thread. Uh, 
And if you are a thread and you want to yield, you capture your continuation, spawn it as a new thread, and then call switch so that somebody else can take over. So this right here is, honest to goodness, a complete implementation of a threading system that you can write in Racket. And here is a little program. So we have a looper that will uh, run a loop five times, and every time it will print out a number. And then it will yield after each print, and then at the very end it will switch. So if you spawn this into one looper and then you call looper, the two will run back and forth between one another, and it will print out 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, and then it's over because they both only go through five times. So this is obviously not an interesting program, um, and it really just shows that delimited continuations allow you to express threading very simply. And since threading is at the core of operating systems, it gives us a view on what else operating systems have. And the other thing that operating systems have, other than of course booting off the hardware, which is very boring, uh, is that they have system calls. And what are system calls? System calls are access to sensitive resources of the operating system. Here we have a structure that represents a kernel where you have the list of threads, which is the concurrency provided by the operating system, and here we have a safe. And the safe represents any uh, volatile resources that the operating system manages. You know, it manages the hardware, it manages the file system, all these resources of the kernel. Its, its job is just to be the sole master of them to protect you from user programs. So we'll, we'll write a little operating system that's just protecting one thing called the safe. So here's a little program that we'll write in our operating system. And so what this one does is it has two loops, and it calls this function swap. Uh, I hope that the, the two loops look very simple to you. Uh, they'll go through five times, or seven and five, uh, and they'll print something out. But the interesting thing is that they call this swap function. And swap will be the system call that our operating system provides. It's kind of like a rendezvous, where what it does is it allows you to install a value into the safe and then read out what's currently in the safe. And so these two functions, as they run, they swap values back and forth with one another, printing out what their current value is and what the value installed by the other guy was. So if we look at how this, is, how this operating system would be implemented, uh, we first define this boot function that starts off with an initial kernel. The initial kernel just has the main program and zero in the safe. And it's going to loop forever until there's no more threads. And then each time it loops around, it's going to step one thread up to one system call. To step one thread, we figure out whatever the top thread is. We run that thread until we reach a system call. Now that we have this system call that says whatever they want to do, we'll execute that system call on a new representation of the kernel state and return that back to the boot loop, which is going to go through it again. So what is a system call? A system call is a data structure that represents, one, a user context, and then two, whatever the operation is and its arguments. So when you spawn a thread, you need to know what the child is. When you end, there's really no parameters. Obviously, in Unix, you have a number that you return. Uh, and with our special operating system, we have swap, which has the new value that you'll go inside of the safe. So this representation of uh, system calls is really just like how system calls work in a real operating system. Because a system call is represented by a number, which is kind of like its type tag, plus uh, some meaning given to the other uh, arguments available to the interrupt handlers. So if we look at how to execute a system call in our uh, operating system, when we're spawning a new thread, we create a new kernel state um, that has the user context, the child context, and what all the threads were before. When we're ending, we just uh, forget what the user context is because this, pro this thread is gone. And when we swap, uh, if you look at the last line, we put the new value of the safe inside of the kernel. And the interesting thing is how we represent returning values to the user context. The user context is a continuation, which means it's a function that you can call. We've always assumed that these functions don't take any values, but in here we're going to return whatever the current value of the safe is, put that back on the thread queue, and let things go on. So uh, we have to ask ourselves, how do we generate these system calls? And the way that we do it, if we were to look at one system call like thread, is it takes some parameters, and the first thing that it should do is it should capture its continuation, which is the continuation of this thread. That corresponds to like its stack and what its registers are, really what it, the future of that computation is. And we'll call that the user context. And then we'll abort or throw 
a data structure which stores the user context and the arguments to this thread back to the kernel. And of course, we want to have one of these for each system call. And so since we're in a language, since we're in Racket, we'll write a macro that generates one of these functions for each one uh, of the system calls that are available. So now we've got these functions for each one. So this, these are the throwers. And so the one thing that we haven't seen is the catchers. How does the operating system catch these system calls? And the way that it does it is by just installing a continuation prompt, calling whatever the code was for the thread, and then waiting for it to be thrown. Uh, the place where we wait for it to be thrown is very opaque in this uh, code example, but it's actually this word values right here. So this function right here is where you write down what you want to happen when uh, a value is thrown to a prompt. And what we want here is to have that be returned, which in Racket is a function called values. So what, putting all this together, we have a full operating system with system calls in 50 lines of code. You know, but these are all just the lines that I showed you before, and this is 50 lines of code that implements a threading system and a protected kernel with a system call for interacting with the safe, scarce resources of that kernel. Since this is just 50 lines that's very, very general, you can use this to create domain-specific operating systems that specialize in the various operations that they provide. It really provides a new paradigm for protecting resources. We normally think of protecting resources through things like monads, which seal them off through a type system, or locks, which protect them through stopping what things from interacting. But operating systems for a very long time have had a master-child or master-servant relationship um, between uh, dealing with scarce resources. And so this supervisor-supervisee relationship is something that a domain-specific operation operating system like this provides. And it's beautiful to me that we can provide it in just 50 lines of uh, simple racket code that uses delimited continuations. Simple, of course, if you know what delimited continuations do and what they are. So at this time, I'd be happy to uh, take questions uh, about anything that we've talked about uh, or anything else that you know or care about related to continuations. Thank you. Regarding your web server, um, it's kind of abstract, so it's yes. hard to see all the details. But um, are all the requests self-contained uh, so that every all of the state is basically in the client, and your you know the server gets all the context back through the URL, or are you is it implicit there that you're doing some session state with the cookie, or I mean that wasn't clear to me. Yes. So the question is. Um, are requests self-contained? Uh, is everything on the client, or is there session state that's stored in something like a cookie? So a, a continuation represents the, um, the control flow of your application. A session uh, cookie is more like um, the heap. Uh, so when two threads are interacting, they both have different control states, but they have a single data state that they're sharing. So uh, cookies are not the correct way to understand uh, the interaction between uh, multiple pieces of an application. So that's why, for instance, cookies are valuable for representing things like shopping carts, which multiple page views are both modifying, but they're not useful for keeping track of where you are on two different sequences. So because of that, um, so that's one thing. So the next thing is whether or not continuations are entirely stored on the client, um, or whether they're stored uh, on the server and on the client. Well, I mean, all the information to be able to pick up. At the yep. Right. Yep, I understand. So uh, with the Racket web server, it's possible to fit anywhere in the spectrum. Um, if you want, you can store everything on the server or move everything to the client. There are certain resources that cannot be shared with clients. So for instance. A continuation may contain a reference to a file descriptor. There's no way to turn a file descriptor into something that a client can store. What you can do is you can give the client a name which refers to a file descriptor, but ultimately the file descriptor needs to remain on the server. So these foreign objects that cannot be serialized are inherently necessary to be stored on the server. And the Racket web server allows you to specify when you want those to be allowed, when you want them to be stored, if you want things like that to even be possible, or if you'd prefer it to error when it tries to serialize, that sort of thing. Uh, so those research papers that I cited before uh, talk about the ways that we uh, deal with things that are on the server versus on the client. Uh, obviously, it's valuable for things to be on the client, um, but it's much more complicated to have a serializable representation of a continuation. Given that continuations are these like closures, most closures in most languages are not serializable, so it's difficult uh, to do that. But yes, any other questions I can answer for you? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that you have a 
Yes? Uh, I've been seeing uh, posts about delimited continuations in other languages like Scala. Do they work the same way? Yeah, so um, if you read a Scala's page on delimited continuations, they'll talk about how they're inspired by the um, ICFP paper that I cited before. Um, and so they specifically target uh, some of the research that we've done in Racket uh, in their implementation. Uh, I would not classify myself as an expert on exactly how Scala implements its continuations. Um, but my understanding is, is that uh, it has many of the beautiful things about them. Um, so the question is, continuations seem like something that people study a lot, but they don't get a lot of use. Um, I think that uh, people uh, do, in fact, use them a lot. Uh, it's just a matter of whether they use them implementing them themselves or implementing them or having the language provided for you. So for instance, almost every JavaScript program that uses an AJAX request is using continuations. Um, it's just a matter of whether, those can, whether they know that they're doing that uh, and whether they are informed uh, and sort of improved in, them, in themselves by that experience of knowing that. Um, and so I think that the point of this talk is that once, given that uh, continuations are widely used in a sort of an amateur sense, if you understand the details of them, you may unlock new potential for how you could use them. And I'm also uh, saying that it would be nice if more languages like Scala were to imitate Racket by having delimited continuations uh, in their fullest sense. Uh, I would say that one thing is that maybe continuations, particularly on the web, are associated with uh, ancient uh, web applications um, that are not like the glitzy Web 2.0 ones, but nevertheless, uh, they still have the same uses. Uh, they, they are still useful in modern web applications, just that all the papers refer to these old style. So I think that's something that's definitely relevant uh, for sort of the PR image of continuations. Anything else? Yes? Did you um, see or you're familiar with the talk that Rich Hickey gave about the closure async libraries? Because it seems like they started that out with uh, <coughs> elementary remarks about using these essentially piles of functions to be the kind of control flow machine. Can you explain if there's an you know, advantage that you may not have mentioned about using like a continuation? Sure. Uh, so yeah, so uh, the question is, did I see Richicki's talk on asynchronous um, and in particular on the downsides of using piles of functions for managing asynchrony? So I think that Rich and I agree that using piles of functions for asynchrony is very bad uh, because it's complicated to keep track of what the control flow state is. And one way to avoid that uh, is by switching to the concurrent ML style of asynchrony that he talked about. But another way to avoid that is by having your language produce those, quote, piles of functions for you automatically so that you can write the straight line code um, that is easier to understand and have an expert, the compiler, um, produce the piles of functions for you. There's nothing wrong necessarily with the model of asynchrony um, that delimited continuations, for instance, use. The main problem is in the cognitive overhead of having to do that yourself. The things that compilers do, humans could do, but we have compilers do them because it makes our brains hurt. What's the, is there a fundamental trade-off between those two models? Um, I think that there are different models of concurrency. Uh, concurrent ML, uh, OK, so I think maybe the answer is that um, there's not a dichotomy between the continuation style of asynchrony and the concurrent ML style of asynchrony. They're both useful for different situations. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about this, I would suggest reading the, um, the Kill Safe Servers um, or Kill Safe Synchronization paper by Flat and Findler um, that talks about how concurrent uh, ML primitives um, have some problems, but when used in a certain way, allow really expressive forms of asynchrony. Um, and that is in the context of Racket, where you might otherwise assume that the limited continuation style would be the one that would be preferred. So I would say that they're really, there's really no either or between them. They're both useful, and that's why uh, powerful languages like Racket have both.
And with that, um, we have my awful sound to say that I'm done. Thank you so much for being here, and I will talk to you all later.